hunters ask me all the time, what are the, what are the qualities that you need for a great hunting parcel? Whether you're going to buy it, whether you're going to lease it. And I think there's 20 that I found, and that's why I'm holding my phone here. I have quite the list that I want to go through that um, if you find these qualities for a hunting parcel, they can combine, give you an outstanding potential to not only grow a great herd, but to hunt a great herd. Now, I have a bet with Dylan that I can uh, complete this in six minutes or less. So we'll see if that happens. It's kind of a long list, but first one, water. Deer do not need to take a drink of water every single day of the year. In fact, they can go weeks without taking an actual drink. Most of the moisture requirements that they, they need can be pulled out through the, uh, through the habitat, through the food plots you offer. If a property already has water, is it in the right place or the wrong place? In the wrong place, meaning does it define deer movement by one of your tree stands, in particular a bow stand? If it doesn't, could be pulling deer away from your stand. Water on a property may be a good thing. It might not, but you don't have to have water. I love dry properties where I can add my own water, specifically where I need it to be. Number two, low timber value. Higher the timber value, the more hardwoods that you have, the harder it is to not only create and create diversity, create the edge that you need for deer, um, but actually it's really tough to bulldoze out, out those areas, um, create diversity, cost you a lot of money, and in the end, yeah, you can get some timber value. But what I found, the lower the timber value, the higher the quality for whitetails and wildlife value in general. Number three, edge, edge and edge. The more diversity that you have, the more edge you have. White tills are creatures of edge, and amazingly enough, if you're actually managing for a high degree of edge, don't be surprised not only do you have a huge whitetail population, but you have a wildlife bonanza in general. Rabbits, pheasants, grouse, squirrels, everything. Small game, different bird species, they need a lot of diversity. The more edge you find in your land, it could be edge between old timber, new timber, young, young growth, edge is critical. Number four, open food sources. Open food sources. Do you have a little bit of ag land? Maybe some overgrown pasture, some upland settings. If you have those pre-existing open areas, very easy to put food plots in, can save you a lot of money. And if they're located in the right spot, then perfect. You already have the ability to go in and add, and add high quality food where you need it. Very important on your land. Number five, large neighbors, including public land. Love to have large neighbors. Large neighbors meaning you're buying a 40, 50, 60 acre, 100 acre land. Do you have neighbors of 100 acres or more? And some of the best properties I've been to is have had some large chunks of public land right next door where because of private land along a road system, it blocks off the public land. Some monster bucks of great age class that can be sucked into a well-managed whitetail property. Don't discount a land just because it has public land next door. Number six, habitat diversity. The more diversity, the better. Lowland, upland, different types of timber. The elevation changes create diversity, habitat diversity. I like to see a mix of shrubs, grasses, hardwoods, young hardwoods, open fields, swamp, hemlock, cedar, red cedar, whatever it might be, conifers. The more you can get happening in one spot, the better your chance of attracting whitetails and all types of wildlife. Topography, I love topography. And around here, we're in an area where it's four to 500 foot changes in elevation. Topography is perfect because it allows you to cheat the wind. Morning thermals rising, evening thermals settling, daytime thermals spinning, gives you the opportunity to cheat the wind and hunt different stand locations with the same wind, even though you might have the wind coming behind you from your behind in the morning, lifting up with the thermals. Gives you a lot of ways to cheat the wind where someone in flatland doesn't have. At the same time, any type of elevation change, it could be a five foot elevation change on a property in southern Michigan, allows you to access stand locations from behind ridges, make sure the deer can't see you coming in, coming out, and of course the wind advantages with topography. But topography also increases buck age structure, gives the deer the ability to hide and escape hunters. So anything, all things being equal with land, hunters, number of hunter, hunter density, if you have good topography, the buck age structure goes up. So it's no wonder that all the way along the Mississippi and the bluff countries of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri, all the way south, Illinois, that you get great buck age structure when the topography is up. And that's evident by a lot of those states. Multi-side access. 
If you can only come in from one side, you're really limited, especially if you're coming in from the west with the predominant westerly winds, whether they're southwest, north, northwest, you're coming in with your winds. So if you have one side to choose from, I choose east, but boy, I'd rather have north, east, south access, west, east, south, whatever it might be. If you have multi-side access, you'll be at a huge advantage, whether you even have the ability to legally cut through a neighbor's land, maybe a, an access or an ag land parcel. Great access gives you a lot of options. Road access, I actually love road access because you have a 30 acre chunk, a 40 acre chunk, those deer are used to a lot of road noise. It allows you to just pop right off a road, hunt 30 yards in in a bow stand to deer that are unsuspecting. They're used to a lot of road noise. You can get into that stand very easily without spooking them. Passionate whitetail habitat neighbors, awesome. Can happen two ways. Either they build this incredible habitat, attract a lot of deer to it, and then they hunt invasively and spook them off, which actually happens to a very high percentage. Habitat improvements aren't defined. They spook deer every time they get on and off the land. They hunt their food plots, over hunt the land. Where do all those deer go? They go to your land that's managed with a high level of definition of movement, great habitat, and you're not over pressuring it. So between the two of you, you attract a lot of deer in the neighborhood. Those deer are gonna slant over to you. Now on the flip side, if those passionate white tail neighbors are, are managing the property like I'd like you to, then to me, the power of those two properties working together, often you're working on this herd over here, neighbors working on this herd, there's a little bit of overlap, but I found that you can actually increase your potential several times more than just the two of you um, by yourself with properties that are separated. Putting those two power and the power of those two properties together, working on a high level of not only habitat improvement, but hunting pressure management, boy, the sky's the limit then. Even if it's a 40 acre parcel here and a 60 acre parcel here, putting the resources into both those that you each have can create an incredible opportunity. No pre-existing MFL or CRP programs, government programs that the, the land is enrolled in. Yeah, great savings on your taxes, but if it limits you on what you can do with the habitat and the habitat plan and manipulation of the habitat, then you're really behind. I, I can't stand some of those programs except for when you actually put the whitetail plan in place, get all the pieces together. This is a, a switchgrass field. This is a bed, hardwood bedding over here. These are my food plots. These are my acreage. This is where I'm putting water in. Then you enroll it in MFL. Then you enroll it in CRP. You let your plan dictate what's going on in the property, and then you enroll in, enroll in the government program to save on your taxes. Now, there's sometimes there's a lot of flexibility. I've worked with foresters that are very flexible on working with you to create an MFL plan or a CRP plan, a woods management plan, a state funded or government or federal funded program to where you can enroll your plan in at the same time. And really, and I've worked with those forces, those plan forces together with a plan so that you can actually enroll it all at the same time and get a lot done and get some free things too, get some assistance from the state or feds on putting a pond in or putting in CRP fields. But again, always great to designate that plan first, then enroll it, not the other way around. You might cost you a lot of money to get it out, lower your property value too. Exterior cabin location. If your cabin has to go in the middle of the land, that's not necessarily a good thing. Every time you go in and out, you're spooking deer. Screened parcel access. I wanna be able to drive up to my parcel for example, not in a huge valley system where when I pull in with my vehicle, every deer in the whole property in a big giant hillside looking down at me can see me coming in. You wanna be able to get to the edge of your property without spooking deer, let alone walk on your property without spooking deer. Adequate soils, dry soils, neighborhood big buck potential. If the neighborhood shows great antlers, great genetics, great history of big bucks, then the soil concerns really aren't much of a concern. You can always plant rye, you can always plant clover in poor soils, you can always work on the soil. What you can't deal with are giant rocks, land that is too wet to actually move about the land or even plant food plots. So don't just look at a land, if it has great soil, think, well, this is a great deer parcel. There's a lot of other uh, considerations to look at and uh, it may or may not be a great property just because it has great soils. You can always work with great soils by putting food plots in the locations they need to be which may or may not be the best soil locations. Interior access trail system. Whether it's putting tree stands up, deer retrieval, I'm 47, soon to be 48. If I can drive to the deer that I just shot down, I drive to it after dark during the hunting season, I get my deer out, very non-invasive way to, to work on your land. 
natural pinch points. Boy, if you have rock outcroppings, you have a, a swamp system that goes to the edge of the hardwoods and there's a bench, any way that you can funnel those deer down, maybe this swamp constricts down to an island crossing, back to a big swamp where you can hunt those funnels that go through and it matches with the habitat plan. The more funnels, the more complexity that you have on your land, the more diversity, the better. Agricultural setting. I had my property in the UP of Michigan. I carved out eight acres of food plots, 14 total plots, put food plots in, and uh, had to do a lot of work to that. Had to build a deer herd um, over the course of five to eight years, starting with almost nothing. A lot easier when those deer are already there and you could already go in to an existing population. And finally, that brings up an existing high quality deer population. Doesn't mean that you have giant bucks running all over the place, but if you have some good numbers to work with and you're in a decent area that has the potential of producing the buck quality that you're after, which could be vary from person to person quite a bit, then you might just find the perfect property as opposed to having to build a deer herd over five to eight years like I did in the past. So existing population is, uh, is great. Big funnel neighborhood hub. When I look at an aerial photo, I love seeing those properties where here's the timber, here's a ditch line, ditch line, woods coming here, maybe some grass fields coming from the bottom, surrounded by act field. So that, that property literally is the hub of deer movement in the area. It doesn't mean that you're going to attract a whole bunch of does and fawns during the season, but bucks travel at night. And if you have a great habitat and they can follow all those pinch points and funnels onto your land, that you could have that property that is the hub in the entire neighborhood with funnels stretching out like tentacles for several miles in any direction that'll pull mature bucks into your land to find the improvements and maybe get them to stay um, under the cover of darkness. Well, I think that's uh, all of them right there. And Dylan, I have a feeling you're gonna tell me I lost a bet and I'm buying lunch. You're buying lunch. I'm buying lunch. So I hope that helped you with buying your property this year, maybe finding a lease and good luck. There's a lot of points. I'm gonna expand that on my blog that is associated with this video too. And uh, I hope you find that perfect deer hunting property in 2018.